In the last video, we looked at how different kinds of atoms can produce different spectras and, and different spectral line patterns, and they can be either emission spectrum or absorption spectras. So if we have, uh, for example, a hot gas and all the electrons in that atom are in high energy states, as those electrons fall to lower energy states, they'll send out uh, beams of light with very specific energies and very specific wavelengths, and those wavelengths will exactly correspond to the colors of this emission spectra. Or I could have a bright source of light behind my atom, and if this atom is cold, so all the uh, electrons are in lower energy states, if a, a, a frequency of light, if a certain wavelength of light comes in that's at just the right uh, wavelength, then it could excite that electron into a higher energy state. And in our spectra, that will have absorbed that color of light, so we'll see a dark band in that absorption spectra. And we also notice that these emission spectrum, these emission lines and these absorption lines will exactly correspond with each other. If this is the wavelength of light it would give it off when going in one direction in this transition, then being bumped back up in the opposite transition corresponds to the same wavelength of light. So we, we see these absorption lines and these emission spectra, and we looked at a number of different chemicals and noticed that for each chemical, for hydrogen, helium, sodium, and magnesium, they all have their own characteristic spectra. So some may have only a few, uh, some chemicals may only have a few spectral lines, some may have, have more, and, and different spectral lines may have different strengths. But these each of these spectral lines corresponds to, you can think of it as a spectral fingerprint. So if we can identify these spectral lines in uh, coming from some object, we can identify the chemical that is giving off that light. So let's take a look at the spectrum of the sun. So this is a zoomed in version of the spectrum of the sun that we looked at. So we're only looking at part of the spectrum. And we notice that for the most part, it's fairly continuous, but we have these, these uh, parts of the spectrum that are missing. And they, each of these uh, dips in the, uh, we have intensity on this side, the intensity of the light uh, versus the wavelength of the light. And I should say that th this wavelength of light is in a, in a unit called angstroms. And we have 10 of these angstroms. It's just a different measure of length equals one nanometer. So if I want to convert these, these measurements back to nanometers, we should be putting uh, a decimal on each of these values. So uh, just moving the decimal to the left one space. So we can convert that to nanometers, but we're not uh, too concerned about specific numbers. But we notice that we have this spectrum and there are absorption lines involved. So let's say I have uh, where these come from is let's say I have one of the lower layers of the sun and by lower layers I mean just under the atmosphere of the sun. So we have a very hot kind of surface of the sun and then a little ways away we have the atmosphere of the sun where there's all sorts of different kinds of, of chemicals and the sun has an atmosphere just like the earth has an atmosphere. And from these bottom layers this is a very hot object, so it gives off a nearly black body spectrum. So there's going to be uh, yellow light going through, there's going to be the red light going through, and there's going to be blue light going through. Uh, but as this light passes through this, this cloud of slightly cooler atoms, absorption lines are going to form based on what types of atoms are, are present in this, in this atmosphere. So let's take a look and compare these chemical uh, spectra to the absorption lines that we see in the sun. Well, if we look at hydrogen first, we see that this, uh, this hydrogen emission line corresponds with this kind of dark band, this absorption line in the sun. So where, where the intensity of the light dips down at that particular frequency, we know that hydrogen has to be present there. And not only do we see that spectral line of hydrogen, but we see uh, this spectral line. If we, we go straight down, we see a dark band right underneath there. And this spectral line of hydrogen, if we go down, you, you might need to turn up the brightness on your, on your monitors to see this, but there's a dark band there. And those correspond to 
dips in the intensity of light at those particular frequencies, and those correspond to, to different spectral lines of hydrogen. So we know that hydrogen has to be present in the sun, in the atmosphere of the sun at least, because we're getting these spectral lines from the atmosphere of the sun. We can't say what's present farther down in the sun, we can only say what's coming from this, uh, this solar atmosphere. Now, that's not the only thing present. Uh, we notice that sodium has, has its, uh, its absorption line present in this spectrum. So we see a dip, so we know sodium's in the atmosphere. Uh, magnesium has two strong spectral lines, right one beside the other. And here in the solar, uh, in the solar spectra, we see two strong absorption lines right beside each other. So that corresponds to magnesium. So we can identify these different chemicals in the solar atmosphere. And one thing that's, uh, that's kind of interesting about uh, particularly the helium, we do notice that there is, there's still a helium spectral line right about there. And we see a little dip down. It's not labeled on this particular picture. But one kind of interesting thing is that this is actually how helium was first detected. They, uh, astronomers were looking at the spectrum of the sun and they noticed this uh, spectral line that didn't correspond with any of the elements that were known at that time. So they said, well, this must be in, from a new kind of element. And helium was actually only isolated for quite a few years later uh, after it was detected in the spectrum of the sun. So that's kind of an interesting side note. Now, there's a couple of things that we should, uh, we should be careful with when we're saying that these elements are, are present in the sun. First off, we see that kind of the depth of these spe spectral lines or the strength of these absorption lines. Uh, for hydrogen, uh, we see a certain depth of these lines. And for sodium and magnesium, we see similar depths. Now, does that mean that there's the same amount of sodium and magnesium in the sun as there is uh, as there is hydrogen? And the answer to this is no. And this is because uh, spectral lines different chemicals will have different efficiencies of, of absorbing uh, of absorbing light so efficiency so for example if I only have a little bit of sodium uh, present in this atmosphere but it's really efficient at absorbing uh, at absorbing light then I will only need a small amount of sodium to get that spectral line whereas hydrogen is a lot less efficient at, uh, at absorbing light, so it takes a lot more hydrogen. But if we look at these chemicals in, in a lab, which we can just do on Earth, if we look at these chemicals, then we can determine what the efficiencies of all of these chemicals actually are. And, and that will help us really nail down how much of each uh, of each chemical is actually present in the solar atmosphere. Now, these spectral lines also depend on on the temperature. On the temperature of the object. And let's see how that how that happens. If we go back to our picture of uh, of how the absorption lines actually form, we said these uh, electrons start in low energy states and as a certain frequency of light passes by, it absorbs that light and gets bumped up to a higher energy, higher energy state. But if this atom starts out to be a little bit hotter, these electrons might already be excited into higher energy states. So there may not be any electrons in these lower energy states to absorb that light, in which case we won't see those, uh, those parts of the absorption spectra. So if we look at, say, uh, at sodium, then we see this spectral line is very strong, but this one isn't as much. So that may be because uh, the efficiency for this specific wavelength uh, isn't the same, or maybe the temperature is not ideal for, for this one to be as strong a spectral line in the sun. But by knowing how much these uh, these various spectral lines are showing up uh, in a single chemical. This can give us a better idea of what the temperature of that gas is, or it can tell us things about the pressure as well. 
So we can learn a lot of additional information about the gas that we're, that this light is actually passing through. What does the solar atmosphere actually look like? And this is used for, for distant stars. We can look at stars that are far away and identify the different chemicals that are making up that star and what temperatures and pressures on the surface of that star are. There's, there's one last application that I want to talk about in this. And let's say I have some distant star and, and I'm gonna say the Earth is over here. So here's Earth. And this is obviously not to scale, but let's say there's a planet around this star. So, so I'm gonna have a planet around that star. Maybe that uh, planet will pass in front of its star from our perspective. And if that happens, some of the light from the star will pass very close to the planet and might even go a little bit, just a tiny bit, into the atmosphere of that planet. Well, if that happens, then we have another one of these cases where we have a hot source behind passing through a colder gas, the atmosphere of that planet, and then that will allow us to pick up information about what the atmosphere of that planet is made of. And this is how we actually detect the atmospheres of, of distant planets that are not even in our solar system. So, so that's an interesting application, and we'll talk about different techniques uh, that use these spectral lines uh, to study distant objects. We'll talk about those a little bit more in future videos.